Nice. So everybody, I'll just give uh, everybody a, a, a moment here to check in before I go over some technical details. And uh, so I'll just get started here. Thanks for joining us, everyone, for our uh, second update from the Census Bureau. Uh, before I hand it off to today's moderator, I just wanted to cover a few technical details. Uh, this is Zoom webinar, not Zoom meeting. So I did want to clarify that your microphones and your videos are disabled by default, so you don't have to worry about see being seen or heard. If you have any kind of questions, uh, we are going to ask that you put those in the Q&A feature of the webinar dashboard that's towards the bottom of your dashboard. Um, you'll be able to see every question that's been asked and you can ask questions anonymously. You can upvote uh, questions that you like or would want to see answered and you can add your own comments if you need to. Um, if you have any technical issues or if you just have a comment or some kind of side discussion going on, uh, please use the chat function. Um, by default, it'll be set to all panelists. Uh, so if you want everyone to see it, make sure you select the all panelists and attendees drop down uh, in that two area of the chat area. So um, without further ado, I want to hand it off to uh, Bill Gill, our Director of Government Relations. Thanks, Mike, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us today on this uh, important issue, which on behalf, on behalf of ACRO, it's a it really is a very important issue for us to make sure that uh, all the students are on all your campuses and universities are, are, are counted for the census. We know how important this is. I'd like to just kind of briefly thank Mike Sisson and Annette Stroud, our Associate Directors of Content and Curriculum for their uh, technical support here. And I really do appreciate all the work that um, the census is doing. And uh, let me introduce Dora Durante, Judy Belton, and Judy Lem. Um, and I'll turn it over to them and just so uh, we're we'll start to we'll start the webinar. All right. Thank you. All. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> so Bill, so first of all, this is Dora Durant that is speaking. Um, I am chief of the special enumerations branch um, that uh, who's responsible for um, the enumeration of group quarters that include colleges and university. They'll let Judy introduce herself. Good afternoon. My name is Judy Belton. I am the Assistant Division Chief for Special Enumerations at the United States Census Bureau. I'm Judy Lamb. Hi, everyone. I'm Judy Lamb with the Census Bureau's National Partnership Program, uh, the Academic Portfolio. Okay. Alrighty, okay, so can we um, move to the next slide? So first of all, on this next slide, um, I know that most of you all know the importance of, of the census um, at this time, um, but I wanted to just take this uh, the time to um, mention this one more time in terms of how we too recognize the importance of um, the census for everyone, because we know that right now it is to conduct a census of population and housing and the importance of it as it relates to the apportionment uh, and representation. And especially for most of you in these college towns, we know that it is so important because that there are direct taxes and money that will be coming into the college university towns. And so we draw congressional and state legislative districts, school districts, and voting districts, and then therefore distributing more than the 675 billion federal dollars annually to these various states. Um, and so we know that um, college towns, um, you are going to have these, in the, in, even though they were not there, during the uh, on April 1, it is important for this next 10 years that all of these locations are funded um, adequately. Um, so let's take a look at the next slide. So here for this one thing that is most important, even though when you take a look at here, you can see that we do so many different things to try to make sure that we get a complete and accurate count of the population and housing. And that is, you know, making sure that we establish where to count them with the address um, um, canvassing operation, 
trying to motivate them by our using of our partnership um, and communication, then put out the self response and then doing group quarters by going to places like um, colleges and universities and then um, correctional facilities and other places and then following up with non response for those places that don't respond because we have that objective to try to count everyone and then last but least but not uh, to take all that data and then just collect it and then release our results. But the thing that is important is in the center here is that we're trying to count everyone once, only once and in the right location. And so you're going to see when we're going to keep going back to that later on when we start talking about the type of data that we collect. Um, next slide, please. So here, uh, if most of you can remember, and this was just before um, the um, the actual pandemic caused us to close out. We had actually finished our um, group quarters advanced contact operation. And so we first of all started making phone calls to the GQ um, student housing administrator. And therefore we confirmed their, their name, the address information, the contact information, the phone number. Uh, and also sometimes we got a business email address which came in handy because of what happened. We've had to um, email some information to various people. Uh, we collected an expected day census population and maximum pop. And so we did all of those things where we allowed the facility managers um, to choose a method of enumeration. And then um, just before to be able to start the actual enumeration, which started on April 1. But it just seems that just after we had completed our March 6th, somewhere around early March, right after that. Then at that time, um, we started getting the stay at home order and the colleges and universities were releasing their um, individuals from their college campus um, just before our April 1 date. And that is where we started doing the actual enumeration of individuals. And so let's take a look at um, the next slide. <laughs> And so here, when we are talking, the information that I am talking about is this is the operation where we were in the field. We're talking about the student housing that uh, where we have a um, GQ type code is a 501 and a 502. And those were for student housing that was owned, leased or managed by a college university and are owned, leased or managed by a private company um, agency. So as you can see, most of them, they were either on or off campus. Um, and then, and this included our fraternity and sorority housing that was recognized by the colleges or university. And then again, the, um, the naval ones, they are included in our military group quarters, uh, which is still a part of the group quarters operation. But the 502s, the key thing about that is that they are typically, um, um, leased by the bed, by the bed leases, a single liability leases. And so those are the ones that we were doing that call and that was a two part operation. Um, 501 to 502. So let's move to the next slide. So looking at that. So when I spoke earlier about the fact that um, I think around March the right after March the 6th or March 11th and 12th students um, were sent home for their safety and so most people were calling and said well okay so where do I count this just because in low just because um, we had COVID-19 um, that did not change our residence rules our residence rules stated the same uh, it would be for those students that would have been there on April 1 that would be counted, they were still to be counted at that on campus or off campus residence where they had lived and slept most of the time leading up to that time. And that time they would have been at that college university address. So those were the ones that they were living away from their parental home while attending college uh, in the USA, um, living away from their um, parental home, but staying at their home only on vacation or a break. And even foreign students that were in the US while attending um, college in the USA. All of those are to be counted at that um, campus, um, uh, off ca on or off campus residence. Um, the ones that were counted at their parents' home are only the ones that were living at their parents' home while they were attending um, college. 
those college students that were living outside of the United States while attending college outside of the United States, of course, they were not counted. And then if they did not have a usual home, um, staff members were also that were living on college university student housing were also counted at that university. Uh, so those residence rules are still into, in play. Um, the next slide. So again, so when we finish up and taking a look at coming out of the um, 2020 census group quarters events contact operation, and I know a lot of all of this also follow up with our webinar that we had on uh, February, joint webinar that we had with the Department of Education. Um, so we had a, we spoke a lot to administrators in terms of they're trying to decide which method to enumerate. But coming out of that to select, we had 47% chose the electronic response data transfer of what we will refer to as e-response. Another 35 chose the drop-off pickup option, which is one of the common methods because that allowed the students to do their own self-response. 9% chose in-person interviews, which is another one in terms of self-response, and then 7% chose paper response data collection. Um, the e-response and the paper response, of course, they um, were FERPA related um, because that meant that administrators were providing information. Um, let's move to the next slide. So given that the dismissal, uh, but then once we had COVID, so given the current situation of where we are and the dismissal of students from on campus, then we started reaching out to college and universities that chose both the in-person and the drop-off pickup method, those self-response method. Then because they would, did not have, you did not have students there on campus. They could not do this. We could not um, drop off a package and then the students fill them uh, out and then we come back and pick them up. And so considering the safety of the student housing administrators and also the safety of the uh, Census Bureau, then we reached out and we asked them to either choose e-response or the group quarters paper response data collection options. Now, while the two methods above do not give students the opportunity to self-respond, it did allow us still to actually get a accurate, a, to get a, uh, to accurately enumerate the students at the school in spite of the fact that they were temporarily living at have home or elsewhere, but not in within that college um, jurisdiction. So now, again, as I stated on the joint webinar um, when we had with the Department of Education, uh, we understood that FERPA, there were implications and that students, schools at that point in time could provide directory information for each of their students without student consent unless the student had opted out of the disclosure. And there was a clear understanding, which we have known for uh, previous decennials, is that they could not include race, ethnicity, and gender as directory information under FERPA. And so we understood that. So the thing is, is that is, and it's also an understanding that the directory information is different across the board. Uh, so we understood that, but again, using the two methods still allow us to be able to accurately enumerate students in spite of the fact that they were maybe temporarily living at home or elsewhere. Uh, next slide. So now, in, based on what I stated earlier, the information that we're looking for that is on both the e-response template and the paper response template is the same information that would have been on the, that is on the individual census questionnaire. It was asking for the name, first name, last name. Um, it also asks, do you live or stay at that facility uh, most of the time? And, and then also it did not say if you do not, but besides there, what are the alternate address where you could give in the address, rural route or city or the state and or the zip code. And then the next question is number four was, what is your sex? Um, and then the male or female, and then the age on census day. And then last but not least, um, it asked about Hispanic origin. 
And then the seven, what is your race with a breakdown in terms of different race um, statuses. So those were the questions, those are the same questions that were on both of those, the e-response template and the um, paper response template. Um, the next slide, please. So in terms of going, remembering the information that we had that was on the individual uh, census questionnaire, also remember the information that we had on slide three, that it is so important to count everyone once, only once and in the right place, requires having the right information for matching records. What does that mean? That means that we need to have enough that the duplication of data could potentially occur up to three times in this decennium. The parent could, and some of them probably will still report the student um, that is at their home. The student could have gone online and self-reported, and then the school may report the students. So here it is so important that we make sure that we have them in the right place and we only count them once. So to be able to do this, there was critical um, matching um, criteria that the Census Bureau uses to perform this matching. And that is the using of name, the date of birth, age, alternate address, and sex. Uh, and I know that sex is one of those things that we probably cannot have. But the more complete the information, for example, on the name, the first name and the last name, the age or the complete date of birth, then that's the more confident that the Census Bureau can have that two records that are linked together or are the same person. The completeness of the name data as part of the Census Bureau matching operation for applied, it's important to have a complete name on this one because like some people will say, well, okay, I don't, cannot give you the name, but I can give you a person record. And that is where it comes into, because a lot of colleges and universities were saying, well, I can give you aggregate data. If I can give you aggregate data, but in terms of giving you aggregate data that will have everything, I cannot give you a name. I can just say I have a certain number of people that are a certain age, I have a certain number of people that are of this, age, of this um, race, a certain number of this race, I have a certain number of this ethnicity um, um, and, 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 and of this race. So that does not help us in terms of making sure that those individuals are counted once and only once and in the right place. So it is important to make sure that we are able to get their actual name instead of person one and person two. Uh, next slide. Next slide. But if anyone wants to weigh in with a question. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So I'm sorry, go back. Go back, I'm sorry. Okay, so here in terms of, of the day. So now we started off with there being um, the enumeration of group quarters uh, operation, which would have been April 1 um, through um, June 5th. So which was our um, initial dates. So right now, as you can see, we have group quarters enumeration dates are April 1 through August 26. So even because we had the um, um, e-response, e-response, there was no reason to stop anyone that was gonna upload an um, e-response. That just mean that people were just, wherever they were, it's just sending that date. We did not um, delay the e-response. So we actually had data actually coming in <clears throat> on April 1. And so, um, so GQE actually did get started. And so we first had April 1 through June the 30th. And these were people that had initially selected uh, to respond by e-response. Then we decided, uh, as you can remember earlier, I mentioned that we sent a letter and say, okay, um, we were looking at people to do an alternative uh, in terms of the in-person where individuals will self-response. And one of those were the papal response data collection. So we understood that papal data response, the original way was meaning that we went and we picked up a papal response. So we have um, 
take a look at an alternative method of getting in a paper those paper administrative record. And that is by mailing out and mail back. So we've had the different um, ACOs to communicate um, with the, um, those individuals that had selected the paper response and offer them the option to participate in what we call a mail out, mail back uh, method of the um, paper response. And that is where they are actually uh, taking the, um, a package, they have an envelope, they put in the envelope and they put in the template. And so they are mailing it out to individuals based on the expected count or the maximum clock count, uh, which they will get. And in it, there is a self-addressed a self, self uh, FedEx label for them to be able to uh, mail it back to the ACOs. And therefore, that will people, because individuals are trying to get this completed um, as close to April 1, so they can get that off of their plate. And then, of course, the paper response, again, is the one um, where it will require someone to come. And so starting in July the 1st is when we're then going to take a look at if, you know, with the situation is conducive that we will go into the field to do any type of in-person where we have to engage with the public uh, starting July the 1st through August the 26th. And that means a paper worker will need to meet with the GQ contact to obtain that paper listing and then um, return that um, to the um, ACO. And again, those are the same questions that were on the ICU. Okay, next slide. So, all righty. So now, Judy, um, um, this is slide number six. So, so first of all, Judy, before you start, so going back, so all of the information that I have just talked about is again, just for those individuals that were um, um, on campus um, that were owned by the college and or the university, or uh, they were owned at least by a private company, but it were leased by the bed. And those are the ones that were only uh, on campus, off campus student housing in terms of where everyone would have been reached out to during the 2020 census GQAC operation. Okay, all right, Judy, this is slide 12. Okay. Um Thank you, Dora, and thanks for that clarification. Um, as Dora mentioned, um, what she has been describing um, for um, the last few minutes is our group quarters data collection operation where we are focused on um, enumerating the students that are living in university-owned housing and um, privately owned home, um, housing that students may live in that would be under that GQ type 502 that she described earlier. Now I want to um, give the administrators a heads up of another ask that we have. Um, looking at the data that's coming in um, so far from the 2020 census, um, we've observed that the response rates for some college towns are lower than expected because the kids have gone home because of the um, COVID-19 situation. So what we're um, proposing to do in the next um, couple of weeks is to reach out to the um, administrators at um, the universities and ask if them if they can provide us administrative records for all students that live off campus. And this is our way of, way of ensuring that we have counted the students in the right place. Um, as Doris mentioned a few times, we um, know that because of the current situation, our students have gone home. We can see that the parents are including them sometimes on their questionnaire, um, on their census return. But then we also see that we may be um, missing students. And this is very important that we count the students where they live and stay most of the time. Um, so I wanted to take this opportunity to give you a heads up that this is an initiative that's going to take place very soon. Um, you will, some points of contact at the university will receive a phone call that's separate from our group quarters operation and ask the point of contact um, if they are able 
to provide the Census Bureau with administrative records of the students who um, live off campus. Um, we are fully aware of the um, constraints that we have. We know that um, because we are asking for administrative records that FERPA um, guidelines um, come into play, that you know, directory information, so on and so forth. We're very much aware of those, and we, of those um, constraints and um, we're gonna work through those. But again, just giving you all that heads up that this is coming soon and you know, we appreciate all of the work that you're doing um, to help us have a successful 2020 census. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to um, Judy Lim. Judy. Thanks so much, Judy. Um, and so now I'm going to just do a brief review of, of what the National Partnerships Program has done to help promote all of the great work that the Census Bureau has done um, in, in collaboration with our partners. Um, for the past year, the Census Bureau has worked to actively engage higher education partners to reinforce the importance of a complete and accurate count and also relay the key operational details that Dora and Judy just reviewed. Um, we've worked with key institutions, including the Big Six associations and student-led partner groups and provided them with messaging and materials that can be shared with their constituencies. And these materials included toolkits, um, newsletter and website copy, sample op-eds, uh, one-page handouts, and social media posts. And all of this is turnkey information that can be easily shared. Um, we also just released a page on our website specifically geared towards 2020 graduates. And I'm going to throw that link into the chat box so you guys can check it out. It was recently released, so um, hopefully this is a new piece of information that you all can share with your, with your audiences. Um, we've also had Director Dillingham connect with university presidents on the importance of student response to just again reinforce this key messaging. Um, in addition, we previously uh, were working to partner with organizations to plan in-person events. And these events kicked off back in September of 2019, uh, often coinciding with civic holidays to leverage social responsibility messaging towards a greater awareness and interest in the 2020 census. Um, spotlights ev spotlight events included census messaging at voter registration drives and the MLK Day of Service. And we continue to work with partners today through virtual environments with regular meetings and webinars such as these. Most recently, uh, in recognition of this year's graduates, uh, the Census Bureau partnered with iHeartMedia to bring the Class of 2020 commencement speeches by some of the most notable people in the world. Uh, Director Dillingham and Michael Cook offered congratulatory messaging to, messages to the graduating students, which was a lot of fun. Um, and I'll also drop that link into the chat once I'm done uh, speaking. Uh, the Census Bureau continues to collaborate with school administrators to spread the word to off-campus students who may have missed their 2020 census invitation, which should have been received in the mail before March 20. Um, and as we are connecting with these key contacts, uh, we continue to ask that one, folks respond to the 2020 census at my2020census.gov, and two, that we reinforce the message that um, students be counted at school, even if they are temporarily elsewhere due to COVID-19 adjustments. Um, and so there's continual information that's getting pushed out to communities uh, nationwide. And we are super thankful for all of our partners uh, collaborating to, to spread the word um, and continue to help us spread this important message. So thank you again. Um, and back to you, Judy Belton. Thank you, Judy Lim. And um, I think Dora, you wanted to wrap it up? Um, yes. I. Um... I was looking at um, some of the, at that point in time, I was actually looking at a few of the questions. Um, so, um, but in terms, before I look at the questions, one of the things that we have here is that I spoke earlier in terms of the fact that we are still trying to make sure that we keep the public um, individuals and GQ administrators informed as to what is going on because there are times things are happening because we just don't know. And so we have different websites. And so we have these or some of our website links that individuals will be able to go to 
um, to see where there have been various updates as it relates to uh, deadlines and things like that that is going on with the Census Bureau. Uh, because earlier I mentioned the fact that for those individuals that had chosen and selected um, the e-response um, during the GQAC, we had a deadline, but we do know that even as time has goes on, then there are individuals that are changing their method of enumerations by colleges and universities. You all had chosen like drop-off pickup and other methods, so if you're just briefly changing the method of enumeration, then of course there's an extended deadline through to August 7th, so we know that you'll be able to go online and see where those deadlines will get updated. And so it also gives you points of contact to reach out to if there are questions, like people are having questions in terms of, of uploading and technical information there. And actually, last but not least, there's actually, we finally went on and put a, uh, a website <laughs> out there in terms of to be able to help people to actually upload for the e-response template. Okay. So at this point in time, we can try to answer questions um, if there are some at this time. So um, thank you very much for uh, providing this um, that information and update, especially the information about that uh, the census will be reaching out to all the institutions to try to get some um, administrative data. And just to provide a little bit more clarity around that, um, that's what specifically the census talk bureau was talking about when regards to limitations to information that institutions can give out, and that's being um, directly impacted by FERPA. And just so. A reminder, um, directory information is a lot of information. It's it's the name, date of birth, and the address, which is what the census is uh, specifically wanting to get. But in addition to it, they could also provide um, email, telephone number, um, academic major, and academic status. And so it's, it is a lot of information. I understand that some institutions may not have all that information as identified as directory information, and um, that that's something that an institution will have to work through. But those all that information is allowable to be given by the institution under FERPA, um, and so I just wanted to provide that clarity. Um, there is um, um, some questions here. Um, I'm going to go kind of by the order um, that we kind of got them. There was a there's a question about if a student returns from study abroad. Obviously, that means that the individual was studying abroad for the spring and they return back home. Um, should they be counted on campus? So that was one of the the questions uh, when we went back and looked at the residence rules. If they were studying abroad in the foreign, then they are not to be counted in the 2020 census. Because they were okay. not. Um, mm -hmm. Right, so it's because they weren't, they were not physically on campus. They were not physically supposed to be on campus on April 1st, correct? Correct, correct. correct. Um, here is, um, this one's a, if a person does end up being counted in multiple different locations, i.e. their parents versus um, the campus, which one will be counted? So, okay, so that is for when we talked about the um, unduplication. So as long as we are able to have, if we are able to get from the college and universities as much complete information as we possibly can, they are to be counted at the college campus, but we need to have that information. One of those things, and I want to make sure that I, I highly um, express this, and that means that we need to make sure that the we know at that college university at what, what dorm they were actually in, uh, and then the alternate address of where they would be counted, because then therefore if they are on their um, parents um, uh, or another address, we're able to remove them from there and place them at the college or university. Yes, just to um, back on what Laura is saying is where the student is the address at which the student lives or stay most of the time. And if they're in school, if they're at the college address, that is the place that they're at most of the time. And that's where we want to count them. 
And when we use that most of the time, we are saying most of the time as of April 1. And, as, and that would have been at that college or university. So there's been a lot of uh, questions regarding a FERPA waiver um, in regards to um, legislation in Congress. The just to provide an update in the um, in the Heroes Act that left the House, there is language in in the in in the legislation that would provide a provision where the would. Um, facilitate an institution to provide information um, like uh, race, ethnicity, um, and sex. The issue that um, institute or registrars and, and other folks have issues is the privacy issue um, and kind of and then essentially setting up the dangerous precedent of, of uh, basically you would be amending quote unquote what directory information would be um, and essentially uh, changing the law that's been around for 45 years and um, and the kind of the dangerous precedent that that would set. Um, again, kind of a, institutions um, are able to share everything that's called directory information, which includes first name, date of birth, um, address, um, email, phone number, uh, and a whole bunch of other information but there is concern about the dangerous precedent. And while right now, um, you know, the language specifically states that it cannot, an institution cannot provide an immigration status, there's concern that if you are able to amend FERPA once, why not, um, why would not you be able to amend FERPA in the future? And then you could be able to, um, members of Congress would be able to amend uh, what, personal identification information um, that an institution would be required to provide. Yes, so, so we understand the concerns and um, we um, looked at the legislation of the language in the bill ourselves yesterday and we're not ready to um, speak to that. Um, this is something new for us as well. Um, so we un certainly understand the concerns and so we need to just wait to see um, how that plays out in the next couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, because like Judy said, we, we know, we know that there is a proposed legislation to, to waive, to waive FERPA. Um, and uh, we'll just wait on it. And we understand, we heard what you said, you know, in terms of what precedents are being set and stuff like that. Uh, um, we understand that for um, COVID was the president that we would never ever thought that we would be faced with also at this time. Yeah. So now someone asked a question uh, and says, schools defined what is a directory information just because the law allows date of birth. If a school doesn't include date of birth in their own, it can't be released. And we understand that. We understand that a lot of people are having that with the, the date of birth. And that's why a lot of times we're saying if you name is one of the things that we feel like is one of the things that people can uh, provide. So providing that complete name. And I don't know if they don't are not able to provide date of birth, that means that may not have the age, but having the complete name and the alternate address will help us to be able to um, do that um, duplication because then if they are put on another um, census form um, and another one, we will have that name. And so that will be one in terms of where it can be matching that will be can be done. So right now, um, I'm just so everybody should know, we're going to take all of these questions and put them um, in, a, in a, an attachment to the, at the end of the webinar where we'll, folks will have um, be able to get all the responses to uh, these questions. So we'll make these available. And as I mentioned in the chat previously, the webinar will be available uh, about 30 minutes after we finish here on the um, webinar uh, link on, our, on the ACRO webpage. Um, who, who will the census contact at the university for off-campus student data requests? 
I guess that I guess you're probably I guess the question is 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 uh, kind of the is it going to be the registrar's office or is or the university identified census point of contact? I guess maybe that's the question. Right, and so this is Judy. So we're working that uh, working this out now. This is this is a new um, initiative for us. Um, so there's a couple of ways that we're thinking about how this can be done. Right now, um, we have a group that's separate from the group quarters operation um, staff that may be reaching that, that will be reaching out to the universities to obtain the name of a contact person who can help us with this off campus file. Um, here comes a question. This is an interesting one. Um, any suggestions? for off-campus international students who have graduated and gone home. A lot of our international students have left and we're having a difficult time getting their attention about the census. So when you, um, I think we actually actually <laughs> had that question came to us in one of our emails. We were told that if they can provide whatever information they have on that international student, because that international student was would have been on their campus um, at that time. Now, I, I'm not as sure if they're asking, well, I'm trying to get them so that I can get them to probably give me consent. Um, so if they don't have that information, but if they have reached out to the other um, students, then that will be um, sufficient. Um, it may be that the information that you have for all of your students may not be exactly the same uh, for every student. So, but just give us what it is that you have. And most important, it is so that we can make sure that we actually get a, an accurate count. And again, like the name and the um, address of where they were on campus and the address of where they were off campus. Um, and, and, that, have, and that will be, uh, and, and that will be part of the information that you will be requesting when you go out to, and you start doing the outreach to the campuses. So, are you talking about the on-campus students? We are doing that already for those that are. No, the off-campus off ones. No, right. when you when you reach out to the university, the off-campus ones. The off-campus students. Okay. Yes. So yes, Judy. That's Judy. Yes, they will be. The, yes, she'll be asking the same thing. Yes. Same thing. Um, somebody asked uh, about a timeline of when the e-responses from group quarters will be added to the data. So I think I may have answered that. So um, for, and I think I, re I had responded, we had a deadline of June 1 for those that had um, initially um, selected uh, e-response during the GQAC. Uh, we um, we know that a lot of people are changing their method of enumeration um, now, and so the drop dead drop dead date is August six, August seven. Okay, August. So that's going to be August six, because that's oh. the question: is what, what's the what's the final? There was a question: of what, what when will be the final date for individuals to provide their data? So the data, if they are going to provide it by e-response is August 6th. The day in terms of where somebody can come out and pick it up will be August 26th for on-campus students, for 501s and 502s, for GQs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next question is um, guidance. Um, uh, for the request to turn over uh, records. Um, so will you guys be providing um, some guidance in regards to um, what you're going to be requesting from the institution based on uh, FERPA parameters? Um, because I guess the question is that with so many flux and changing campuses just need clear guidance and a point of contact to reach when they have a question. Um, so will this be posted on the web or um, kind of this change how how are you going to make this um, better known within the higher ed community 
So is this really, is this, um, I'm assuming this may be related to the off campus uh, file request. Um, Probably, yes. Right. So for that particular um, initiative, we will let the POC know during our call what data items that we're looking for. And of course, we want all of the data items that would be on a census questionnaire. But we do understand that because of FERPA, um, we may not be able to get all of the data that we're requesting. Um, or if this new um, bill opens the door a little bit more, we don't know. So we know that there are some limitations, but when we make the phone call out to the POC, the POC will be provided. Here's the information that we're looking for you to include on this file. And then we also will be providing the way in which we want the data to be transmitted to us. It will be different from um, how we are um, getting the data for the on-campus students. So in other words, we would not be asking for the contact person to use the e-response system or the paper listing um, method that Dora spoke to, but it'll be completely different. Um, and in some ways it may be, um, we'll, we'll be providing all of that information when we reach out. So the purpose for mentioning it here is so that you are aware. So I'm happy that we're getting the questions um, so that you're aware and a lot of you would not be surprised um, when the Census Bureau begins to reach out in a couple of weeks. And so we had planned to do that around June 16th and all of the information that we need or requesting will be outlined at, at that time. So, um, and let me just add, so for individuals um, asking in terms of questions about uh, FERPA, just always remember that they, when we, it's also on the um, Department of Education's um, website, and I think the letter that comes from just post-secondary schools, there is, you want to have that conversation with the Department of Education Student Privacy as it relates to um, FERPA. They are the ones that um, actually explain FERPA, um, the Census Bureau, that is outside of our scope in terms of how to explain that um, FERPA. Yeah, and the uh, Department of Education provided guidance back in January, um, uh, two, two letters of guidance in regards to what information um, an institution can provide right. without without needing consent from the student. Um, I don't see a lot, of, I don't um, I see like any, any, any new questions. Right now, for a moment, I know that uh, the census folks have been reviewing the the Q and A's and uh, has also been always has also been kind of answering questions as they are going. So, so I heard I have a oh okay the off campus okay I see this question Judy and one of the things that they are asking for the off campus information purposes one concern but sometimes. Um, Sometimes students, as it relates to the local address information, all samples, the data has been historically bad. Sometimes they don't update it. Sometimes they withhold it. They, we could give you the names and the date of birth of a pretty readily. What will you do if we do not have the address? So. Right. Yeah, I think I saw that. So um, if you don't have the address, um, that's very critical information that we need um, to be able to um, place the student in the right, at the right address um, and be counted once and only once. Um, but if you don't have that information, it's not a part of your records. I don't, I don't think that we're asking you all to go get this information to be able to provide it for us, like calling the students up, that kind of thing. Um, but that is critical information that that we need um, to be able to um, make this work. 
So um, I have a, I'm reading a question here. It said, what do institutions do whose directory information policies only allow the release of names, no date of birth, if there is no FERPA waiver? Um, and so, uh, again, under FERPA, you're allowed uh, without institutions are allowed to release name, date of birth, um, uh, email, telephone number, address, major, um, enrollment status. Now, now, the fact that institutions choose not to include all that, that is definitely an institute, that's, that's, that's an issue and that's an institutional um, issue. If and as all institutions have to do at the beginning of the year, they, they self-identify what directory information is um, for that institution. So if they were, if they thus wanted to change the, what, the definition and be able to expand, what they would need, my understanding, I can talk, confirm this with Leroy Rooker, as you all know, the, the master of FERPA, an institution would need to revamp what it identifies as directory information and they would have to notify the students that they are changing with the term directory information and including these data points. But then the, just like they currently, then the, the, the students would have the option of, of, you have to opting out if they don't want to, but you do have to do a notification of the changing of what directory information is. So, uh, yeah, so someone said that the only thing that they will have will be the full name and the address as you have the alternate address. That would be sufficient, uh, we understand. Uh, and that would be sufficient to be able to get them counted in the right place. And I just sent that response back. Okay. Um, what about, this is an interesting one. Uh, what about a study away? So they were taking classes in DC or Silicon Valley, but not residing on campus or in in-campus housing. Yet they were not kind of like, basically they're doing an internship and they're still enrolled in, the, in the school. Where do they fall? So, so here is, this is one where they are temporarily away at an, another assignment. And, and I guess the thing is, how long were they there? Were they, wh where would they have been on April 1? Or uh, how long were they there? Um, I think that's one of the key things. Where would they have been staying the majority of their time um, um, on census day? <clears throat> and that is where they are counted. <clears throat> So it's because if the silicon, if, if the person in um, DC has them enrolled, and I don't know if you are saying I gave over the enrollment to them, if they are enrolled there, they'll be counted there. But if you still have them enrolled, then um, it, that's, I, I've seen, heard that that's done different ways. And so I can't answer them because colleges and universities use so many different policies. Right. Um, Dora or Judy or Judy, um, is there a centralized um, person to who handles the POCs at colleges and universities? The one comment came up is um, they've had a lot of turnover of personnel and no one seems to know who the original uh, POC on our campus was. Um, so they, is there a way to get to know who the contact person originally was, was uh, per institution? So if we are talking about group quarters, um, <laughs> I hate to say this, but right now, and I, and I, you, there were a lot of emails. We have actually done a good job of actually going through uh, most of the emails and we have gotten a lot of them down. We may not have gotten them all. So when you are trying to find out who was it that someone talked to during the advanced GQ advanced contact operation, um, Right now, I guess I am one of the, a good contact person <laughs> to be able to send that information to, and I will get it to my, um, to my staff. Is that the end? <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, the, we'll have we'll, uh, included as part of the 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 slide is the contact information. Um, so anybody who really wants to know should then just reach out to to Dora and try reach to out. get. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because a lot of them are trying to reach out. Yeah, we'll be we are able to be able to let them know exactly who was the point of contact for each one of the different um, student housings that was here. And 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 I would um I, I'll add that um, if you are aware uh, of a point of contact that's no longer that we had in the group quarters operation that's no longer um, there um, and you have the name of that um, new person I would um, make a request for you to share that information to Dora because that will help us when we start our calling um, on June 1st and no. we, yeah, yeah. I mean, June 8th, I'm sorry, on June 8th, when we start to reach out to the points of contact that we already have, you know, that we had it during advanced contact. So if you are aware, um, you know, it will be great if that information can be passed along as well. So here's a question. Um, so we're talking about uh, Dora being the contact for group quarters. What about off campus? Um, who is, do, do you guys have a separate POC for that or is that? Okay. Yeah, so we do. Again, and who would, and who manages that? That would be Sarah Brady Clark, and she is um, on this call as well. So Sarah is the um, is your person for the um, off campus administrative records file. That's Sarah Brady Clark, C L A R K. Okay. Could we? Um, I mean, uh, well, maybe we'll add that or her contact information as well and for off campus. Yes. Yeah. I just put that in the chat area, her email. Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, I think. I think that we are, we have answered most of the, we have answered all the questions um, that I mentioned. Um, a lot of it has to do with purple waivers, um, contacts. Um, I did see a question about someone asked if, what if they don't have records um, for off campus students? And we do realize there are some. Um, colleges and universities that don't have um, um, students that live off campus or surrounding um, the university like some of the of our larger universities um, and we'll, we'll we're working through trying to identify um, those colleges and universities um, and um, you know I would just ask again if, if, if you're an administrator for um, you know, like one of those colleges and universities that don't have um, off-campus um, students like um, some of the larger ones, you can share that information as well. And then that, that'll help us not to, um, you know, burden um, some of you by calling there. Um, I see a question that someone asked a question. I just want to make sure I get a clarification of it. Someone said we are not we are only able to supply student names due to our definition of directory information. We can send that or send an email to our students requesting they submit their information directly to the census office. What link would the student use to complete the census information online? Now, if we are speaking of for those that would have been living in the college housing they would not, we prefer that to come from um, the student administrator. However, if we are talking about those students that may be off campus, then they can, you can just basically tell them, and that was one of the things that we provided in an update on um, 2020 census for student um, housing uh, administrators, is that if they will go to, and that we just had in the slide, if they will just go to My 2020 Census, 
they will actually be able to pull up and the address as to where they were living off campus in that private. Um, now go back to slide 12. Go to slide 12. Um, as you can see where it says down at the bottom, my 2020 census, there they will be able to find the address as to where they were living and then if they did not get it and then go ahead and respond to the census. A, a lot of the colleges and individuals actually sent that out during the times when they were actually having classes. And so a lot of the students that we have seen have already have already responded um, to the census. I think what we had, what something similar to like 50 some percentage or something like that, but it's still a low number. We're trying to get, uh, most of the people want to get up to 100%. But that's where you want to send off campus students. There's a question that just jumped in here and probably might be the last one. Um, and just to make sure um, to answer it, somebody asks is, will the chat and the questions be shared? Um, all the, we're going to um, create a, a document with all these questions and then have them all answered and they will be accessible um, next to the webinar um, landing page. So yes, everything, the webinar will be available as well as the, the, the Q and A that people have brought up. Um, but this is a, 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 a point here for the census folks. Um, just go over again, your, uh, that uh, someone's just asking about aggregate data on race and ethnicity and sex. Um, would be helpful in the in the process that required to fill in missing data, you know, and to answer the whole issue of why would not aggregate data be helpful? Okay, so I think I actually responded to that um, earlier. Aggregate data will not allow us to be able to when we talked about the matching and the unduplication, the aggregate data will not allow people to give us names. It will say that I have, when I got the whole explanation, it just can say, I have um, students with this, you know, um, all of these different data, uh, demographic um, data. I have this number with this dem demographic, this number with this demographic. We're not able to unduplicate them because now they got them counted in the parents um, place and they made self response. We don't know who that person is. We don't know what address to start doing the unduplication from. So that's why it's, real, it's not sufficient. Um, I think that is kind of all the time we, we had this going till um, 3.30 and it is 3.33 right now. So I would like to uh, thank Dora and Judy and Judy for making themselves available to everybody um, to, and then I'll, and as well to answer their questions. Thank you for the updates, um, what the new steps you guys are looking to do for off-campus folks and the outreach that you'll be doing. Again, the webinar will be um, available and in probably around 30 minutes on our ACRO webinar uh, web page or landing page. And we will work to get uh, these Q and A's up as quickly as possible um, in that same space. I just wanted to uh, say- wanna Thank everybody uh, that- uh, Yeah, and I wanted to also thank on behalf of the Census Bureau, uh, I wanna thank everyone that called in and also for the questions and also for the effort that so many have already done to try to make sure that they um, participate in the 2020 census, because there's been a lot of committed people that are out there. And we want to say thank you, uh, say thanks to everyone for that. And also thank you for ACRO for putting this on for us. We thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And I just want to say thank you for everybody for jumping on and making time on, on, this, on, their, on their schedule. Um, AcroSan's committed to working with the census and um, being able to get the most accurate count uh, on everyone's student camp on everyone's campuses. Um, again, thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Alrighty, thank you. Thank you. Thanks all, and uh, feel free to.
uh, hop off the call. Uh, just for the sake of the recording, I'm going to read some of the questions that had typed answers, uh, just so that the recording is complete from that perspective. So there's no need to hang on for this part because I'll just be reading. Um, so one question was, please define administrative records. And uh, Judy, Judy Belton's answer was, these are records the school has for the students. Uh, another was, have there been any updates from Congress to bypass FERPA for public universities? And Dora Durant answered, there is still proposed legislation to waive FERPA. Uh, another question was, how will the Census Bureau deal with missing birth date and sex info in directory data? Uh, Dora answered, providing complete name information will help to identify these individuals if the two name data items are missing. Um, more questions, what will the follow-up after June 1 group quarters e-response enumeration look like? Will we still be submitting Excel spreadsheets via login and the website? And Dora answered yes for general quarters, yes it will, or group quarters, yes it will be submitting the Excel spreadsheet via login and website. How will you handle non-response follow-up for campus communities where most students live off campus? Those campuses will oh, uh, Judy answered, we will be reaching out to attain that POC. Another one was from the list I saw on the slide, we'll be providing name and alternate address, that's it. And Dora answered, that will be sufficient if it is all you have. We will be able to unduplicate with that info. And uh, finally, if a person is counted at multiple different locations, which one will be counted? And Judy Belton answered, the address where they live or stay most of the time. All right, thanks everyone.